I'm Robert Subrin. I'm president of the uh, Mars Society. I'm also president of Pioneer Astronautics, a small aerospace R&D company. I've been in business for 23 years. And I'm also the author. Uh, people know I've written the book, The Case for Mars. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you I've written a new book called The Case for Space. And I'm giving a talk on it at the Cato Institute, C-A-T-O Institute, which is within walking distance of this uh, place at 6 o'clock tonight. And you're all welcome to come and hear what I've got to say about this, and get a book, and everything. All right, so um, I'm going to talk uh, Mars Direct 2.0, how to send humans to Mars using uh, starships. And by starships, of course, I mean the SpaceX uh, starship um, that is currently under development. Uh, I think a lot of people have been following this. Elon Musk gave a very dramatic presentation in the Texas desert on a night a couple of weeks ago. These uh, numbers here are based on that uh, presentation. The Starship uh, proper, which is the second stage, has a dry mass, according to him, of 120 tons and a payload to LEO capability of 115 tons. These are metric tons. Um, uses methane oxygen propulsion, uh, would estimate a specific impulse of 375 seconds. And if this thing is fully fueled with propellant, it has a capability of a delta V of six and a half kilometers a second, which is enough to go direct from the Martian surface onto trans-Earth injection. Okay. Um, now, of course, when this goes to Earth orbit, uh, it gets to Earth orbit un, uh, with its fuel more or less exhausted, and therefore, if, it, if you wanted to send the Starship to Mars, as SpaceX uh, has uh, um, said they wish to do, you would need to refuel it on orbit, and that will require uh, developing uh, an additional technology of orbital transfer of cryogenic liquids, but they have a concept of how to do that. Um, okay, so... Uh, so here's, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of ways you could use a starship to support a human Mars mission. And also I, I'm looking at the moon mission too. They claim they want to use the starship to support lunar missions as well. And um, so here's the, the delta Vs that I'm uh, um, using in this analysis. And I'll just comment here, the delta V, LEO to trans Mars injection, that's not the minimum delta V. You could do 3.8 will get you on minimum energy trans Mars injection. But uh, with 4.2, you leave Earth with a C3 of 25, you are on a six month transfer to Mars. And if you choose to do a free return, you could bypass Mars and, and, and go out into the inner asteroid belt and come back and you would reach one AU exactly two years after you left. Um, which is why the six-month transfer to Mars is the best human Mars mission possible. If you had a superior propulsion system like nuclear thermal rockets, I would still use this orbit. I would just use the uh, improved uh, propulsion uh, uh, to have more payload. But anyway, that's, since we're doing manned missions, that's the delta V that I'm using. And once again, that gets you to Mars in 180 uh, days or so, or 200 days um, in some cases. Um, all right. All right, so here's the SpaceX Baseline Mars mission. It's very simple in concept. Uh, they send the Starship to Earth orbit. They then send a bunch of additional Starships to Earth orbit to refuel the first one. And then they send it on trans-Mars injection. Uh, and then it lands on Mars. And then it is uh, refueled on Mars with in situ uh, uh, produced uh, methane oxygen, and then it returns to Earth uh, at the end of a, a year to a year and a half on Mars, um, or in the, well, yes. Um, and this is an extremely simple concept, uh, but it has a lot of uh, difficulties. In particular, you have this very large dry mass starship and therefore a very large mass of propellant that needs to be produced in order to enable the return, okay? So it's worth thinking about alternative plans. Now, of course, this Starship plan is derived from a plan that I proposed back in 1990, known as Mars Direct, um, in which you use the heavy lift vehicle, and incidentally, the heavy lift vehicle 
that we designed uh, has a capability very similar to Starship or SLS. In fact, it was SLS. <laughs> that I was on the team that did the preliminary design for what is now called SLS in 1988. Um, we thought it was the simplest heavy lift vehicle you could design because it was just the shuttle stack without the orbiter. Uh, but if you want to make a meal ticket out of it, you can, and they did. But the, the um, but in any case, you've got two payloads there, each weighing around 30 tons. The first, the conical vehicles, the Earth return vehicle is sent to Mars. It, without people, it lands. It makes its propellant. At that time, we did not know that there was widely available pure water uh, ice on Mars. So we brought the hydrogen react that with Martian carbon dioxide to produce uh, methane uh, and, and water. The water is electrolyzed to produce oxygen. The hydrogen is recycled to make more methane. And, and so you fill it up. And then once that is uh, uh, fueled, at the next mission opportunity, we would launch the crew out to Mars in a habitat craft, um, which lands near the Earth return vehicle. And of course, uh, JPL intends to demonstrate absolute precision Mars landing as part of sample return. So that tall pole is going to get knocked down. Um, so this is now, your crew is on Mars. They use their HAP as their house on Mars for a year and a half, and then at the end of that time, they get in the Earth return vehicle, you fly back to Earth. You leave your habitat behind on Mars, so each time you do this, you add another habitat to the base. Okay, so the um, advantage of this type of architecture relative to the Starship architecture is that the amount of propellant needed to refuel that Earth return vehicle is an order of magnitude less and therefore the power requirement is an order of magnitude less uh, to do the, the same amount of propellant, to, well, to do a different amount of propellant in the same amount of time. Now, I should add that both of these architectures share a common trait, uh, which I very much support, uh, which is they go to the Martian surface. That's what the human Mars mission is about. Uh, I have to be extremely critical of the architecture that uh, NASA is currently um, using as a baseline of having a deep space transport based at the deep space gateway that uses electric propulsion. It takes 300 days to get to Mars from there, which is longer than InSight took, which was 200 days, or Spirit or Opportunity, which were 180 days each, or Pathfinder, which was 210 days. Okay, uh, and which go into Mars orbit um, with plans for landing on the surface relegated to the future. We're not going to Mars to set an altitude record for the Aviation Almanac. We're going to Mars, first of all, to explore and then ultimately to settle. Um, anyway, uh, but I digress. Um, okay, so look, there's, a, uh, there's basically three different ways that I propose to use the Starship to support Mars missions. Okay, one is exactly the way SpaceX says, fly it all the way to Mars, surface, and back. So that's the ATW, all the way mission. Okay, um, and similarly, they talk about doing the moon that way too. Um, then you could, instead of sending the Starship all the way to Mars, you could refuel it enough not to go to Mars, but to go to translunar injection or an orbit more or less similar to translunar injection. That is to say, a highly elliptical orbit just short of Earth escape, and then stage off of it from there. Okay, in that case, you get the Starship back in LEO in a week instead of two to three years. And so you could use it again uh, much more swiftly, and you get almost as much payload sent to Mars that way as sending the whole starship there, okay? Uh, and similarly, the moon. And then finally, what if we just use the starship as a fully reusable Earth-to-orbit HLV, okay? Where we're talking about 115 tons to LEO, it's more or less the same capability as an SLS, about one-tenth the cost. So, you know, that, that is certainly an attractive way to use the starship, that eliminates many of the problematical uh, aspects of the uh, SpaceX architecture of record. Um, so now, SpaceX believes in full reusability as the key to um, space exploration. And so while if you were using that third mission mode of just using the Starship to go to LEO and stage off of it, 
you could do the mission more or less exactly the same as Mars Direct, except instead of using uh, ARIES or SLS, you just use the Starship and stage off of it. But in this analysis, I tried to stay in the same philosophy of SpaceX, of full reusability. So what I'm postulating is a mini Starship, okay, which actually would be sized to be uh, the, a fully reusable upper stage of a Falcon 9, so that rather than being a 120 ton to orbit kind of vehicle, it's a 20 ton to orbit kind of vehicle. It's one sixth the size. And that is what we would send to Mars. That is what we would refuel on Mars. And that is what we'd fly back from Mars in. Um, and that would cut the propellant requirement by a factor of six. Um, and in my view, this is a very a rational thing for SpaceX to consider because this would be a fully, it used on the Falcon 9, it would be a fully reusable medium lift launch vehicle with great commercial utility. Um, the, uh, okay, so in, in the, both the TLI and LEO options where we're staging, we use the mini Starship. Um, of course, in the, all the way, we use the full size Starship. Okay. And, okay, here's the numbers. Um, all right. Uh, let's start with, um, okay, the ones, the columns on the left that just say Mars and Moon, those are the all the way uh, options, uh, SpaceX current party line. And what you see, first of all, is for Mars, it needs five tanker flights to orbit, to refuel the thing, to fly to, to Mars and land it there. And then it has to refuel with in situ propellant on Mars, and it would take 600 kilowatts of power to um, uh, make that possible. And uh, that's about six football fields of solar arrays on Mars. Um, the moon, where they can't make their return propellant, uh, it would take, and they have to try to make enough, uh, refuel it with enough propellant to fly to the moon land on the moon and then do trans-Earth injection, take 11 tanker flights per mission, and there essentially is zero payload to the moon, okay? And there's another problem with this too, which is that if you actually try to land the starship on the moon, you would create a crater. Um, and since the exhaust velocity of three and a half kilometers a second is greater than lunar escape velocity, the debris from your landing ejecta could even go on trans-Earth injection. Now, I'm not too worried about the Earth, but you could destroy assets in orbit, let alone the nearby lunar base. Um, so I, I don't think this is practical at all. Okay. Now, if we're talking about refueling, and, and in the case of Mars, you're getting the Starship back in a thousand days or so. In the case of the moon, however long you keep it on the moon, perhaps a hundred days, and then it is flown home. Um, in the case of the TLI staging, well, that looks a lot better. Now you need uh, three tanker flights for either the moon or Mars. They're both going just to TLI. Uh, you can land uh, rather substantial payloads um, on the moon or Mars, and, um, and you get the Starship back in, well, a week or 10 days, if you will. Uh, and then the LEO staging, now um, it requires no tanker flights, which means no need for tanker technology, so you're eliminating a major technology development. Your payload to Mars is, is significantly uh, less now, um, but it's still, well, it's the same as the Mars Direct kind of payload. And in both the TLI and the LEO options uh, that are shown here, the amount of power needed on Mars, instead of 600 kilowatts, is 100 kilowatts. Okay, which is one football field of solar things, or um, uh, whatever, uh, or a, a hundred kilowatt nuclear reactor, which is a much more probable thing than a megawatt reactor. So, uh, in short, this is the wrong way to use a starship. This is the right way to use a starship. Okay, and um, you know, to just spell it out. Starship offers tremendous capabilities to support Moon or Mars exploration, particularly as simply a fully reusable heavy lift vehicle delivering payloads to LEO. Okay, but you really want to stage off of it. 
you could either do it Monster X style or Mini Starship style. And finally, I, I, I do want to bring up one point here because, okay, there's a lot of people out there who say, okay, Musk has got it. We're going to build starships and it will go to Mars and that's how this thing is going to finally get done. But if starship is all they're doing, because right now he's not showing an inclination to develop a mini starship, um, someone else is going to need to build a Mars lander. And I think NASA should develop a 10 ton or more delivery class Mars lander, which could be sent to Mars either off of the starship or off of the SLS. You know, they say the reason why they're building the lunar orbit gateway, because we can't go to Mars because we don't have a heavy Mars lander. If the problem is that you don't have a heavy Mars lander, you won't solve that by building a lunar orbit gateway. You will solve that by developing a heavy Mars lander. And finally, in that line, I just want to make one more comment, that the feasibility of developing a heavy Mars lander has now been greatly enhanced by SpaceX because you could use a Falcon 9 first stage as a reusable system for sending heavy payloads exoatmospheric to hypersonic velocities and repeatedly test Mars entry and landing systems in the 10 to 20 ton class. So uh, there you have it. So let's meet SpaceX halfway. They're developing the Starship. Let's develop the stuff that can do the rest of the mission. Thanks. Do you have any issues with um, a, a return from um, a trans, trans, from, from Mars, specifically the Starship or some of the small Starship, because it's thermally quite difficult to come in at that speed using a non mars body? Um, to return um, from, uh, oh, from trans-Earth injection, Okay, I haven't worked the numbers on that. Now, coming back from Mars on a, a low energy trajectory is not that much worse than coming back from the moon. Uh, and in fact, I guess with a little extra propellant, um, you could do uh, come back from Mars and do a half kilometer a second delta V at perigee around the Earth, and now you would be in a TLI class orbit, and it would be exactly the same as coming back from the moon. So, I, I mean, it's a technical concern, but I think if, if, if they can come back from TLI, they can come back from Mars. It's a question of detailed analysis. I'm not prepared to answer beyond that. Go on. I like it. Uh, I do want to point out that there's one other combination that I'm surprised you didn't look at. You could use the Earth launch Starship to take you into the Trans Mars injection, leave the Starship in its free return trajectory to come back and drop the mini Starship off from that. That combines some of the advantages and many of the disadvantages and some of the other. Uh, but for completeness, that's also a, a possible way to cook that. It is, but the thing is this, that when you're in that translunar injection uh, trajectory, um, you only need, you know, one kilometer a second delta V from there. In other words, you, you loop back and you go kabing and you're on your way to Mars. Um, to, to get to Mars, and so almost all the payload is still getting to Mars, and you're getting your Starship back in a week, instead of if you're going on trans-Mars injection with the Starship, you, you're not going to see it again for two years. So, yes, that is a possibility, but, you know, uh, yeah, you could put that in the trade space if you like. Um, yeah, we have another question here. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you got this PCC, but we're shooting from the moon. But now that we have found ICs on the moon, that contain a significant amount of carbon compound. Could we produce methane there and then you use the starship from there? Well, actually, in the paper, I do discuss if you can, well, certainly if you can at least make oxygen on the moon, that would help that architecture as well. But also, I just think there's an enormous problem with just landing a starship on the moon uh, in the first place. And once again, if you send it on translunar injection, then 
you can land giant payloads on the moon from there. And why try to, you know, in other words, taking the starship to the surface of the moon is like taking an aircraft carrier whitewater rafting. It, it, it's the wrong place for it. Okay, do we have a question back? Stand up. Yes, Bob, a great presentation as you will hear from Bob. Just a note, um, maybe you can comment on this. So part of the problem with sustainability, as you know very well, this is so uh, eventually we'll need to start flying a fission reactor again. Maybe back to the old SNAP program. Without that, we wouldn't have had you know, the Mars drift, because it makes no sense, or uh, any kind of sustained activity on Mars. Can you comment a little bit about the politics and the necessity of uh, applying a, a uh, SNAP involved reactor? Well, uh, or a SP100 type reactor, or look, yeah, nuclear power is greatly to be desired for the surface of Mars or even the Moon. And, um, and it's the most important place for space nuclear power. Um, let me just tell people here about a conversation I had with Kraft Erika a long time ago, because at that time I was an advocate of nuclear electric propulsion. And he said, no, the place where you want your nuclear power source, we were talking about the moon, is on the surface of the moon. And there it can make lunar oxygen, and you bring your hydrogen from Earth, and you combine it with lunar oxygen, and, okay, you have a rocket with 450 seconds specific impulse, but only one-seventh of the propellant's coming from Earth, so you have an effective specific impulse of 3,000 seconds, but at high thrust. Just will RL-10 take you home, okay? So the idea is if you put the nuclear reactor on the surface of the planet and you store its energy in the form uh, of chemical propellant, Okay, and then you have a lightweight flight system where the power of the nuke has been integrated over time and now can be released within minutes in a lightweight system. That's the right way to do it. So I view space nuclear power as a critical system, uh, certainly for a, a effective exploration of, of Mars and the Moon and certainly in the outer solar system. But the most important, the best way it can be done is you can take its power, 100 kilowatts, and you can um, uh, integrate it over a year making propellant and now you release a gigawatt of power in your RL-10, okay, instead of trying to build 100 megawatt space nuclear power systems to drive, to release their energy in real time. So, one last question from myself. Um, you mentioned uh, the lunar landing of the Starship and the uh, regolith that's ingested, it, it ejected and the and the, uh, the effects. I mean, what does SpaceX say about that? I haven't had that conversation with them. Um, the, uh, but there are people who have uh, done detailed analysis of the ejector problem, uh, and I'm, I'm basing myself on, on their analysis. Uh, um, the, um, and um, yeah, and of course on the moon, there's no air to slow the ejector down. On Mars, dust can be slowed down. And, and, and fall, okay, but on the moon, uh, it would be a menace to the lunar base, it would be a menace to orbital assets, and it would probably be a menace to the starship itself as it dug itself into a crater. So, once again, don't bring an aircraft carrier whitewater rafting, but you can sail it into port and then go ashore in a little boat, um, and, and that's the right way to use it. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. See you tonight.